Este, good morning <clears throat> and welcome to our webinar. Uh, my name is Johanna Colomas Bainen. I'm a program uh, manager at the US Energy Association in Washington, DC. And um, so this webinar is being recorded and um, all participants are muted with their webinar with their video turned off. Um, but you are welcomed and encouraged to post any questions you might have in our chat or in the Q&A. Um, and uh, we'll put them to the speakers as appropriate during the presentation. Um, Peter Lawrence, my colleague who's also on this call, and I will be monitoring those, those comments. And um, we may decide to answer some of them in person. If we don't have time for all the questions, we can um, put them to the speakers afterwards. And, um, and they can answer it afterwards. So, um, a quick word before I go over to the speakers. The US Energy Association is an association of public and private energy related uh, membership association, nonpartisan. And uh, we represent the broad interests of the energy sector, both inside the US and outside, by working to increase understanding of energy issues um, throughout the US and uh, throughout the world. Um, USEA has two cooperative agreements with USAID, um, the US Energy Agency for International Development. Um, one is called the Energy Utility Partnership Program or EUPP, which is wrapping up now. And uh, the other is Advancing Modern Power Through Utility Partnership or AMP Up, which is just starting. We have other cooperative agreements with USAID, State Department and Department of Energy, um, but not, and in, not in, this, in this area. Um, so Kristen Madler, our Clean Energy Coordinator at USAID's Bureau for Development, Democracy and Innovation is with us today and um, would like to share a few thoughts. Kristen, the microphone is yours. Thanks so much, Johanna. Um, as Johanna mentioned, my name is Kristen Madler and I work in the Global Energy Division of USAID based in Washington. And we're pleased to welcome you to this webinar hosted by our Energy Utility Partnership Program today. As prices for clean energy and storage technologies continue to fall and countries explore various pathways and net zero scenarios to cut emissions, integrating higher shares of variable renewable energy becomes more urgent and also more complex. So utilities, system operators, regulators, and policymakers around the world are grappling with the policy and regulatory changes that will be necessary to integrate electricity from these sources. One of the system operators, XM of Colombia, asked specialists from our Energy Utility Partnership Program to organize discussions with U.S. system operators with large amounts of variable renewables on their system to discuss some of their lessons learned. And we thought this would be an interesting conversation for a larger audience. So we incorporated the discussion into our grid management webinar series. During this webinar, Esteban Tobon of XM will present some of the key issues they are grappling with in their planning to integrate the huge growth in renewables they are about to face. And Guillermo Bautista and Clyde Lauten of CAISO will share their experiences with these issues. We will discuss lessons learned and key takeaways from CAISO's experiences that can help market operators and regulators, and then we'll take questions. And USAID supports partner countries' power sector transformation to be more green, reliable, and cost-effective. A powerful way to achieve this goal is through a comprehensive approach to grid integration, system operations, and planning, which we will, which we will be addressing throughout the energy management webinar series. Thank you so much to USCA, to Johanna and Peter for organizing this webinar series. And thank you so much to our speakers for making time to join us today. And I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Johanna. You're on mute, Johanna. Thank you, sorry. Um, so as Kristen mentioned, this webinar is uh, part of a series of webinars that we have been organizing under um, DDI. 
Uh, this is a fourth of a series of webinars under the Business Innovation Partnership, part of AUPP. We love our acronyms. Um, and these, all these, the past series can be found on our website um, here, and I will paste this into the chat later on. Um, and we'll also be posting this webinar onto the website, others in the series. Uh, all of these can also be found on our YouTube channel, which I can also share with you. And if you have any questions or comments, um, happy to take them. This is my email, which I can also post into the chat. Um, so this is the second in the series of energy management webinars hosted by U USCA under its EUPP cooperative agreement. And um, it's co-sponsored by the Peak Load Management Alliance, PLMA, uh, and XM, the Columbia System Operator, who have been collaborating with us to um, develop the topics and themes that are of relevance to them and their members, and, um, and, and speaking as well uh, on this. So um, our next one is tentatively scheduled for Thursday, November 17th at the same time on uh, challenges to the grid from uh, distributed energy. Um, and I think that Kristen already gave a good overview of what we hope for in this particular webinar. Um, so I'm just gonna briefly introduce our speakers and we can get started. So Clyde is, um, will be joining us shortly. He's presently a principal engineer at the California Independent System Operator Corporation CAISO or CALISO. Um, he focuses on power system control performance and was principal investigator for several technical studies, including the ISO's renewable resource integration reports published over the years. Uh, fun fact, he uh, christened the duck curve in California, um, which is always uh, an inescapable uh, mention whenever anyone talks about solar panel these days. He was also instrumental in working with NERC to identify ramping capability or flexibility as an essential reliability service and um, has been ex instrumental in developing several operating policies. He was also lead uh, investigator in charge of investigating the California blackout. So um, be great to hear from him again. He's also collaborated with us a number of occasions in the past and we're, we're very happy to have him join. Uh, Jorge Esteban Tobon Villa is um, an operations planning specialist at XM. He has uh, 17 years of experience in planning, operation, and control of power systems. And at XM, he's participated as a user leader in several projects such as operation safety, advanced situation awareness, online safety analysis, multi-site operation, technological improvement of operation coordination, load forecasts, and generation forecasts. And last, uh, but certainly not least, of course, is another longtime collaboration of our Energy Utility Partnership Program, uh, Guillermo Bautista Alderete. Um, he's Director of Market Analysis and Forecasting at CAISO, where he oversees the areas of market quality and performance, market analysis, commitment costs, and short-term forecasting for load and renewable resources. He has a... Um, PhD in computer electrical engineering and has been faculty member at the University of Waterloo, uh, served as editor for IEEE uh, Transactions on Power Systems and is the author of a book on competition and power systems, which we're gonna have to ask him to come back and talk some more about. Um, and he has, as I mentioned already, longtime collaborator of ours and other international programs um, and helping uh, sharing experiences of CAISO with uh, counterparts in Mexico, Chile, Colombia, Indonesia, India, Australia, and Japan. So um, I'm going to hand over the uh, screen to Esteban now, uh, who's going to sort of give a panor panorama overview of, of the situation that, that XM is, is uh, facing here. Thank you. The floor is yours, Esteban. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for this invitation. 
The idea behind these seminars is to hear some of the experiences that the U.S. has had in integrating renewables. Could you confirm that you can see my screen? Perfectly. Thank you. And, uh, and also to look at some of the challenges that we see in the Colombian system when integrating more renewables and when looking at how to leverage our objectives as far as CO2 emissions and the energy uh, transformation as a whole. I will try to give you a brief presentation on the Colombian system first and then quickly go through the challenges uh, covering these four points that we'd like to touch on uh, as a means of uh, general information to give to um, all the experts on this subject who will then tell us about their actual experiences. In Colombia, we don't currently have a significant share of renewables. Basically, by, at, as of 2022, growth is just uh, starting, but we do expect that by 2023, the volume, especially when it comes to solar and wind, will increase extensively. By 2027, we hope to have an installed capacity of 32 gigawatts distributed uh, between wind, solar and thermal with a significant concentration of renewables in solar and wind in the northern part of the country. As far as volume, we're talking about approximately 11 to 12 gigawatts by 2027, with a demand that by that date, well, as per the central planner in Colombia, the mining and energy planning unit in Colombia states that it will be about 12.5 gigawatts, which means that we will surely have periods uh, uh, when we have to address demand over 80%, at over 80%. Some of the um, developments that are taking place, these projects are mostly found in the northern part of the country, which is an area that has uh, found has been found to be ideal for wind and solar radiation. The plants or the plant factors that we might expect from this area for wind is upwards of uh, 0.5 and for energy, it's upwards of 0.22, which are significant plant factors, quite competitive, which has made it so that the promoters of wind and solar power uh, look to this area for their operations. Looking at that capacity in, in the northern part of the country of approximately 8 gigawatts planned uh, to be installed by 2027 and an estimated capacity over 50 gigawatts between solar and wind, well, that makes it so that many actions have been taken by the planner uh, towards the northern part of the country. This part of the country has been typically dry, fed uh, by thermal energy mostly, and, hy and hydro, which is quite abundant in the country, but mostly towards the southern uh, part of this region and uh, to the east and west of the country. And we're seeing that there will, in fact, be a need to transfer major amounts of energy from the Caribbean into the uh, load centers, mostly in the east, in the eastern uh, part of the country where Bogota is, as well as the western and southwestern part with with significant cities. The backbone of our system, of our transmission system, has a a substation one con found in the northernmost part of the Colombian Peninsula, in the region of Guajira. And that substation will catch a major part of the wind energy for this area. The planner is also thinking about connecting HVDC uh, using a bipolar at, at 2,000 megawatts to transfer that energy from the Caribbean 
towards the center of the country. This area in particular has several operational challenges. It's something that's new to us in Colombia, uh, but in the US, this has been broadly analyzed and debated. And what we're seeing is that the load in the area is susceptible to uh, voltage holes. And because of these holes, you start to find other dynamics that the system has not, let's say, prepared for. And this may lead to significant events that might include the disconnect of, of large volumes of energy. So regarding this phenomenon, we've looked at several mitigation options, basically focusing on increasing the level of short, uh, of short circuit at certain points in the area. And increasing the the short circuit level is basically basically means strengthening these these areas and providing greater support uh, when it comes to any kind of uh, alterations, so that these voltage gaps are not as deep, and and that way we can improve the quality for the demand in the area. For this area, then, foreseeing some of the volumes that might be needed and, and that would be installed, we've seen then that there are certain grid metrics that basically tell us that these areas might work uh, at a lower strength than ideal. And for that, we look at several metrics. We use one, which is a reference point, uh, which is a broadly used uh, metric in the in the US, WSCR, where we basically measure the short relative short circuit with respect to the integration of generation sources connected through inverters. And we're seeing that the GSM, the GCM area would receive the highest amount of renewable generation where we expect to install the most amount of renewable gener generation. And that's where we see these values that are considered to be quite low, which might entail a challenge regarding what operations would look like with this uh, asynchronous uh, generation connected through inverters. To tell you about some of the challenges. I think we can dive deeper uh, into these topics in this uh, webinar, but as far as frequency and inertia and the increase in the, in the variability of frequency and the increase in the magnitude of the interruptions or, you know, where, where an interruption might uh, also influence frequency, uh, the increase in the rock off, uh, this might have significant impacts as well in certain generators and also in certain types of uh, load protection, especially uh, anti island protection. And and this uh, would also affect traditional generation. As far as short circuiting, we're seeing an we're seeing an increase in the energy gaps, which means that the short circuiting levels are going down, and that decrease would seem is not as good, and and instead it should remain at a certain level where we can ensure a safe and quality voltage. Uh, increase also in in voltage events. That's something that's also newer to us. Uh, we, the countries who who, as opposed to the countries who have gone through a a, a great experience in renewables, uh, this is something that has to do also with that with that slow recovery of voltage uh, after an interruption. This is uh, a frequency based and can lead to supplementary protection systems such as the automatic load disconnect. As for flexibility and balance, 
That's also something that we are seeing that uh, will entail many changes. Colombia is a market that works, let's say, um, with uh, dispatch and forecasts uh, with one hour windows. And what we're seeing is that in the future, we will need, we will have a longer duration uh, when it comes to ramps due to the integration with uh, solar and wind. So quicker ramps, we're talking about between the peaks and the valleys uh, when it comes to demand response, there will be increases upwards of five, 6,000 megawatts, which would entail a certain operation, a more sophisticated operational interaction, more sophisticated than we have currently. And of course, uh, greater deviations uh, when it comes to demand and the net curve. This has to do also with uh, the programming in the system or involves the program in the system. So when it comes to balance, there is a significant challenge, especially when these events are caused by renewables. As far as those deviations, that's also a significant challenge uh, when it comes to improving the meteorological forecasting tools and forecast alerts or meteorological alerts uh, much better than the country has currently. That's basically what I had for you. Just a very quick overview of the Colombian situation and what we expect for the future. And I thank you all for your attention and thanks to uh, and thanks for having invited me to this space, and I'll give the other presenters the floor now. Thank you very much, Esteban. Guillermo, if you'd like to continue. Yes, Johanna, let me go ahead and share my screen. Can you see it? Yes. Perfect. If maybe you want to put it in a uh, presentation mode. Yes. Thank you, Johanna. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to, to be able to talk about these uh, subjects with all of you. We have two topics that I'd uh, like to present. One related to what we just heard about balance. And, and, and I'd like to give you first a brief rundown of what I'd like to present and go into greater detail with all of you. But for time reasons, I'd like to give you a general overview of how we are today. Every system has its own characteristics and conditions and geographical variations, and it really influ influences how uh, we operate. Starting with geographic diversity, on that, I'd like to show you uh, how we manage connections between geographical regions and how we manage system variability. To give you an idea of some of the conditions and some of the context of how we're structured, we are similar to other US ISOs. We have a very market-based design where, well, the market structure is quite classic in US operators now. It's a financial market that is run months in advance, followed by an energy market, a day ahead market. And we have uh, price variations. And um, by having a market design of this nature that gathers all, all the characteristics that in, can include renewable energy makes it quite interesting. So to give you some context, we must also consider the policies that are in place to see how the system must be operated. 
And this involves, uh, of course, the penetration of renewables. To give you some idea of the magnitude uh, that renewable, the magnitude of renewables in our system, our system has a peak of upwards of 50,000 megawatts. And if we look at what's provided by renewables, well, that can give you some idea of the magnitude of the share. We have upwards of 21,000 megawatts of utility scale renewables. That's uh, wind, solar, and apart from the re renewables at the, at the utility scale, we also have some uh, beyond the meter. Uh, we have upwards of 11,000 megawatts of consumer rooftop solar behind the meter. It's a system uh, that is upwards of 50,000 megawatts as a whole. What we see in the coming years is that we will be adding upwards of 4,000 megawatts of renewables. And we hope that the total growth by 2026 behind the meter will be about 26,000 megawatts, which gives us an outlook on the dimensions of that renewables will assume in the future when operating the system. The challenges are quite broad when involving renewables. We have, of course, our logic in place for conventional energy, uh, but it's difficult to precisely forecast renewables because of their nature. They might not be producing at an unideal time. There's also a matter of ramps. Renewables introduces longer ramps into our system. For example, in our system, we have afternoon ramps upwards of 13,000, 15,000 megawatts. So it's a stress to the system when absorbing uh, such large movements. Another complication has to do with the visibility around these uh, renewable energies. They are quite variable, and, and that gives them uh, certain specific characteristics, which also leads us to the challenge of dispatching as per the market demand. These kinds of technologies, these renewables, uh, can follow dispatch instructions from the market. Around the renewables, we again have different challenges. Even when integrating, uh, or not only uh, when integrating them, but also in operating them, we have had a very deterministic model based on demand forecasts, but the reality is that we are evolving now. We're evolving into a system that is non-deterministic, which requires new products and new procedures for operation. And this all involves a concept that is quite common now in this context around renewables, which is called um, uncertainty. Uncertainty is is uh, more involved in talking about renewables. And when we talk about variability, we're talking about changes that were not forecast too far in advance. Basically, it's the nature of renewable generation. And this also has a lot to do with geograph geographic aspects. For example, a lot of the solar that we have in California is found in the southern part of the state, which is the area that generally has a uh, quite dynamic uh, weather conditions. So that's something that has to be considered when operating the system. Here on the right, for example, we have a profile for solar generation depending on the forecast window. The, the day ahead forecast which is the blue curve uh, we find here. And we can see that the actual variability 
shows us a significant drop in renewables here. There's one point where we have the day-ahead market forecast this way, which was only translated into half of that production in operations, which entails a challenge because when we're looking at the day-ahead market, we're looking at the generation forecast and those changes that happen uh, beyond the day-ahead market and more towards the real-time, uh, for that we need to have mechanisms to absorb that variability that it always arises. This is a very typical profile uh, between uh, winter and spring, and it shows us seven days, consecutive days in March, and we see that there are no curves that are alike. They all vary, and that gives you an example of the complexity of variability and uncertainty when integrating renewables. So how do we integrate renewables and manage that flexibility and balance? Well, we treat it just like any other technology that we have in the system. We are a system where we design the market in a way that we are technology agnostic. They are subject to be dispatched based on price and a certain amount for that price where they might have a dispatch that is determined by price. And obviously the, the most important part here is the generation forecast. We have a system that we've developed that allows us to forecast generation based on uh, day ahead schedule, five minute windows, 10 minute windows. And it's a very dynamic system that allows us to internalize all the changes as quickly as possible. We have made efforts to integrate renewables in a way that they can provide us also with reliability services, for example, and, and rolling and non-rolling reserves. The last component to this complex movement involves a product that was designed specifically to manage what we call uncertainty. It's bound to happen, so so it's really about how we react when that variability takes place in the market. We have a series of protocols and procedures in the market that allows us to end, integrate renewables. And it's about developing a product to handle the ramp capacity and it also involves adjusting the regulation ranges based on renewable dispatch. It also involves the use of multiple forecasts. Some are better for real time, some are better for day ahead. And finding that mix of forecasts to find the best balance between all of them. And obviously, we also have to, in a way, internalize the visibility of renewables behind the meter. This is a major program where we only see the effect, but we want to explicitly quantify the energy that's behind the meter. The matter of the market product that we have for handling ramps is quite extensive, but I can tell you that it's a market product where a price is created, those who would provide that ramp flexibility would be paid that price, and it also allows us to project initially how much uncertainty we might have to address every day. So with that, we can absorb that variability when it comes up in the system. And then the last part has to do with managing reserves. Obviously, this isn't just about energy balance, but also managing congestion. Our system, just like any other, has transmission lines, and depending on where the lines are installed, they might have more challenges when it comes to congestion or not. Typically, what we've seen in our system where we find renewables is that we constantly have to 
address certain levels of congestion, which is part of the market, but but to manage the end results, we have to uh, engage in what we call curtailment. No, okay. And maybe the most critical part of integrating renewables has to do with the visibility and the certainty that we might gain uh, based on their production. In recent years, we've analyzed our renewable integration and have improved our forecasts uh, for renewables. We have different uh, vendors. We have uh, different uh, measures in the system. We have um, a series of procedures for market components, which allows us to update the forecasts and the use of forecasts at a frequency that there might be hourly all the way down to five minutes. And even then, when we're looking at the afternoon and morning ramps, five minutes might be an eternity. But improving that that integration with the renewables, that's where we have found the greatest benefit as well. Years ago, the forecasts were quite precise when it comes to the time needed, uh, including telemetry and receiving the forecasts and internalizing them. That took upwards of 15, 20 minutes uh, before. And in terms of ramps, 15 minutes is uh, thousands of megawatts of production. So what we did was create an internal forecast for our system, which allows us to view the market and respond quicker and avoid that delay when internalizing renewable production. So there's a challenge in having a forecast as close to operations as possible. That's always, let's say, the most critical point when it comes to renewables specifically. That's basically what I wanted to show you, and we can continue with the conversation, Johanna, and maybe give the floor to Clyde. Perfect. Thank you so much, Guillermo. Yeah, there are some questions. Questions for Guillermo. We have quite a few questions for uh, for Esteban. Um, we also have translation, as I said in the chat. Uh, we have a superstar translator on the call, <laughs> just in time for Clyde's presentation, um, which is a relief to me. Um, and the English translation, I'm sure, was a relief to everybody else uh, trying to understand and follow in Spanish. Um, I think we'll we'll leave the questions for the end, um, if you don't mind, so that Clyde can go ahead and give his presentation. Our translator is not able to stay on very long, so if at least we can get through Clyde's presentation with translation, um, and then whatever we can of the question and answers, I think that would that will uh, that will be much better than nothing in any case. Um, Clyde, do you want to go ahead and take it away? Yeah. Can you see my uh, screen? Yeah, perfectly. If you want to put it into presentation mode, we're good. Okay. Um, well, good morning. I'm still trying to figure out this. Uh, it's down at the bottom. There's a little like, um, but otherwise, don't worry about it. I mean, it's fine. Like. Okay, um, so good morning and thanks for um, inviting me this morning. So, as uh, unlike grammar, my uh, Spanish is muy muy poco. So, um, and grammar covered some of the stuff I wanted to cover. So, uh, basically, uh, the challenges, the operational challenges we're seeing right now is really the ramps, and I'm pretty sure. Uh, grandma covered those. Uh, the, the 
challenge I wanted to hit on is on slide three, and you guys are gonna get these slides and you can see. Um, basically, one of the biggest problems we have, this is consecutive days on the left, and you can see how different the net load is. And for those of you that have a system operation background, we dispatch to net load, which is load minus wind minus O. And you can see from one day to the next how net load varies because your wind varies, your solar varies, rooftop solar varies. And this is what uh, the, forecast, the forecasters need to forecast what that net load is going to look like uh, for next day. The, one of the biggest challenges we have currently is the 10 minute variability. And as you can see, the 10 minute variability now can be anywhere from about 1,000 to 2,000 megawatts um, in certain hours. And this is a challenge because, um, as Guerma mentioned, we operate a market, a five minute market. But by the time you make decisions to move units, what happens is your system could change by more than 1,000 megawatts. Uh, real quick, on this plot, what I wanted to show is another challenge that we're facing right now is on this week, we had four consecutive days with very little wind, very little solar. So on the left, it shows you that we need, we need long-term storage uh, within the Cal California ISO of our footprint. And on the right, we have other challenges where we have a lot of wind, a lot of solar, a lot of hydro. And we got to back the gas fleet down really, really low. And this creates some problems for ancillary services because you typically when you have a lot of hydro, a lot of snow melt, uh, it's really difficult to get uh, hydro resources to back off to provide ancillary services. So we depend quite a bit on the gas fleet. This is another reason why we need renewables, wind and solar and now storage to provide essential grid and services. Um, I've got, I'm gonna um, move really quick and focus on uh, the tests that we did. And essentially what it is right now, a healthy grid, we wanted to see what can we do within the ISO to make this a sitting duck, a flying duck. And if you go on the ISO's website, we got eight initiatives right now um, where we're looking at, you know, things that we can do uh, to make this a flying duck. Now, what are the, the tests or two tests that the California ISO did? One was to see if renewable resources could provide essential grid services like frequency control, voltage control, ramping, and frequency control. We can get into things like inertia and um, uh, basically frequency response, right? So with this, I wanted to um, spend more time on the um, results itself. And these are some of the tests that we did. You know, we, we look at voltage controls in a lot of different modes of operation. We look at automatic generation control, ramping capability, and um, again, in lieu of time, I wanted to jump on the test results. So this is key for any system that wants to integrate renewables. We wanted to see in this test here, and this is an actual result. It's a 300 megawatt uh, solar plant without uh, storage. So this is a typical PV plant. And you can see the, we have set points, which is in um, reddish color there. Uh, we had this plant go all the way down from about 290 megawatts, all the way down to zero, back up to about 250 megawatts. And we set a ramp rate of 10% of the maximum capability, so it's 30 megawatts a minute. And you can see how well um, a solar plant could follow. And wind plant, we did the same thing. And wind plant and solar plant, they can follow a set point. Uh, very, very well. So if a system operator um, uh, tell one of these plants to either um, reduce output or increase output, uh, depending on headroom, they can do that very, very well. Um, before we get into the voltage, I just wanted to show we control the system uh, every four seconds. And this is actual four second regulation signal that we sent to this unit. We did this three times during the morning, midday, and on the evening, uh, during the evening. And if you look at this curve pretty well, we the green line is the actual capability of this um, solar plant. And again, uh, we did the same thing with the wind plant. We backed that unit off 30 megawatts, so it could provide regulation service. And if you look very closely, you'd see uh, a red line right behind um, the 
yellow line. And this shows you how well a uh, solar plant could react to four second signals from uh, the ISO uh, operators. So this is automatic generation control, four second control, and this unit was able to follow those that signal very, very well during sunrise, during the middle of the day, which is the, the, the second plot, and then also during uh, sunset, which is, you know, very, very good. What we found out is, is a solar plant and a wind plant could follow regulation signals about 96% of the time, which is really, really good. Um, on this plot here, I wanted to show you how a solar plant could respond to um, a frequency event. This is um, actually here a high frequency uh, event. Um, and what it is, is we took an actual um, event that we saw on the system. We want to see how this um, unit would react to, actually, sorry, this is a low frequency event. Uh, we want to see how quick this unit could respond. Uh, a couple of things you could do. You could change the droop setting. You could change the bandwidth, how fast you want this unit to respond. And I know with discussions with Guillermo yesterday, this is an area right here where I wanted to get into initial response. So in, in the California ISO footprint, we see post contingency. So if we have a fault, we lose a large unit. Within eight seconds, we see minimum uh, frequency on the system. So if you could inject megawatts into the system within the first eight seconds, it's really you try to mimic system inertia. So we can arrest frequency depending on how fast we want this uh, inverter-based resource to react to frequency deviation. And uh, typically, you know, we'd slow this down because currently the West or the California ISO's footprint, we do not have a problem with system inertia. When that becomes a problem, we think about slowing down, no, slowing down, uh, increasing the speed, the response speed uh, for frequency deviation. So we could either arrest um, uh, frequency within the first eight seconds or so, or we can look at um, frequency response in the US is, is how well that unit respond within the first 20 to 52 seconds following a contingency. The other thing we, we, we can do also now that we have a lot of storage, we have over 4,000 megawatts of storage uh, devices on the system. We could inject megawatts uh, really quick into the system. We can also stop uh, storage devices from charging, which again, can help you in the inertia timeframe and the frequency response timeframe, depending on how well you set this up. So, um, Later on this year and early next year, we're going to be publishing a report on the group settings and um, the bandwidth on inverter-based resources. Our um, plan right now is to change inverter-based resources from a 5% group setting to a 4%. Um, you know, we think that's going to help us in regulation. It's going to help us in uh, controlling the grid. Um, and again, in more time, I wanted to show um, this plot here on voltage control. And if you look at the, the blue area, it's a typical synchronous generator. And you can see how limited that is. You know, you have things like field current limitations and um, excitation limitations. But when you come to the blue, I'm sorry, no, the yellow, yellow is really the reactive capability of um, an inverter-based resource, and you can see you can get a lot more reactive out of those units um, in in um, in the reactive mode. What we wanted to see, well, the, the California California ISO, we wanted to go to the federal government to ask for what you see on the right. Federal government came back with something a lot better, stating that inverter-based resources they need to provide reactive support, full reactive support all the way down to 10% of the PMAX. So if the unit is generating 10% of its capability or more, that unit is supposed to provide full reactive capability in the lagging and um, the leading mode. Uh, this shows that uh, yellow here is the capability of that unit. You can see we took this unit, uh, this was a wind plant, we took this all the way down to zero. It was able to provide a green full reactive output in. Um, out and in uh, the leading mode, uh, it was able to consume 100 megawatts. Uh, on this plot here, um, 
the reactive is completely decoupled from the active power. Uh, you look at the very top, you see that yellow line. This is the actual voltage on the system. At this time, uh, this um, orange color here, this is yanking the megawatts from about 260 megawatts down to zero, and you can see how flat that voltage stayed, which is the um, yellow curve, right? So we move this this unit back and forth, and that voltage stayed constant. Um, the whitish plot is when we change the reactive output from that unit. You can see how you can change uh, the voltage. So again, the, the uh, reactive output is different from um, from the active power. So essentially, uh, let me let me come to that again. On this plot here, we were able to to get full reactive output. At the top, at the bottom, we were able to uh, buck this unit 100% um, by um, having the unit follow set points. So you can see how well this unit could follow uh, reactive um, guidelines from the ISO. This plot was very interesting in that the unit was generating very, very little megawatts. So in other words, yeah, at night, the unit could, could uh, consume a small amount of reactive from the grid. And by doing that, it could energize the DC equipment and could produce full reactive. So this unit was producing five megawatts. And again, you could, and we can uh, send this unit all the way down to energize the DC equipment. Here you can see this unit was able to provide 100 megawatts and at the bottom here consume 100 megawatts. Uh, we were able to change the 230 kV from all the way to almost 240 kV to 228 kV, which was pretty impressive, you know, with this one solar plant. Um, so we know the solar plants can provide reactive, it can provide the reactive when the uranium is not there. Same thing we saw with a wind plant. If the wind is not blowing, these new um, uh, inverter-based controls with or the, the inverter-based um, controls with a plant controller could do almost anything. So the plant controller would control all the uh, individual inverters so that it would operate as a single unit. Um, and again, this is what we saw. Um, this is just jumping to the wind plants. Again, the wind plants was able to do the same thing. And here we had this wind plant go all the way down to zero, back up, and then you can change the set points. And, and, and on the, one, the plot on the right, we tell this unit, don't follow a set point, but produce maximum um, uh, reactive at the end of um, uh, the ramp. And it was able to do that. Um, we did a lot of tests with frequency con uh, control, looking at different group settings, and you can see how well this plant was able to follow um, um, settings. Um, again, with batteries on the system now, this is the last one I wanted to show because I see we're right at the top of the hour. With the batteries, the green area now, in the uh, charging and discharging mode, we could get full reactive. Again, the, the uh, on the right, you can see Inverter-based resources can, can perform a lot better than synchronous uh, generators. They can provide you a wide range of reactive control in both the um, uh, lagging and the um, leading uh, power factor range. And the beauty about this plot is the reactive support we can get from uh, storage. So with that, um, I would pause because I see we're already at, uh, at the top of the hour and entertain any questions you guys may have. And at the very last slide, I have uh, two links. You can look at those and those go into detail as to what we did in the window solar test. Uh, with that, I'll pass this back on to um, uh, the moderator. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much, Clyde. This is wonderful. And we had translation for that, which is quite a relief, I'm sure, for everyone who's more comfortable in Spanish for that presentation. Um, entonces, so thank you all very much. We have now concluded the translation section, and we will now take some questions that we have found in the Q&A. We've got lots of questions in the Q&A for um, various speakers. Um, so should we take about 15 minutes to run through them. Um, 
and um, and then we have a, a closed door session with just Kaiso and XM. Um, so I'll start with the first one from Omar Guerra from NREL. Um, he says, Desde el punto de vista de la from the standpoint of planning, the National Integrated System, have you thought of using storage technologies, seasonal storage technologies like hydrogen to mitigate the impact of El Nino? That is, to generate hydrogen in the winter and then generate power in the summer with the hydrogen that was stored. So this is um, a question about use of uh, green hydrogen or, or hydrogen. Um, to balance out um, seasonality in uh, Colombia's hydropower resources, if uh, XM has, has looked into that or not. I think that's for you, Esteban. <laughs> Great. So, on hydrogen, yes, work is being done quite extensively on enabling the infrastructure so that Colombia becomes a powerhouse in that field. What we're seeing is that the potential for renewables in the northern part of the country, like I showed you in the introduction, is quite high and it might be used to generate green hydrogen, yes. I think that's also in the government's plans to boost those kinds of technologies. Development might be a little bit longer, though, because the infrastructure has to be developed first and the consumption has to be there. But there's a great potential for that technology in that energy segment, which is key also when it comes to addressing climate change. Thank you. And we have another question from Nestor Castro. Esteban, this is for you as well. Are you currently developing a, an ancillary services market to provide great support when integrating renewables? Yes. Currently, the Energy and Gas Regulatory Commission, which is tasked with regulating the market, is working indeed on a modification a structural modification to the wholesale energy market. That modification includes migrating into an intraday market uh, system so that agents throughout the day of operations can provide pricing and quantities which would be quite favorable for renewables. And also, as part of that structural reform, certain and uh, complementary services are being proposed. Right now, the Commission is proposing AGC services, which is the service that we have currently that would continue. And it's also proposing a tertiary reserves system, which would be new. That isn't currently considered in the regulatory framework. And it's, it's also proposing new rules for primary regulation services, not so much market rules, but let's say to clarify somewhat the responsibilities when providing services. Regarding other uh, complementary services, we're also looking at the magnitude of renewables that will be connected and the net demand ramp speeds and variability. And with all that, look at the possibility of involving other products that would help in controlling the system when there is a high penetration of renewable generation. Thank you. One final question for Esteban, and then we have some questions for Kaiso. XM, and then we have some questions for, for Kaiso. From Oscar Valdez. Has significant capacity been installed using renewables uh, beyond the visibility and control of XM? And what effects have you seen because of that? Well, the regulatory framework in Colombia 
when it comes to connected uh, dis distributed generation, that does gives us gives us some observability for plants over five megawatts. So those would be covered. The new regulatory framework for the market is seeking to have any plant larger than one megawatt participate in the spot market, and in that regard, in the future we would have good observability for the system there as well. It's a road that we're still starting off on. Historically, and, and I think this has happened to every country, historically the distribution system has not been looked at in detail by the central operator because there weren't really many issues and the generation that was installed was basically quite autonomous. And what we're seeing now is that there's a tighter coordination between that generation and the operator. Uh, the central operator, which is key, and that's something that we'll be addressing in the coming sessions for this series of webinars. So that's a very important subject. It is being looked at, and we will address it and see how it can become part of the support provided by USAID. Thank you. You gave us a very good lead-in for the next seminar that we'll be having. So, we have a question for Kaiso from Omar again, and I'll try and translate it into English. I'm going to translate this next question is for Kaiso, so I'm going to say it in English. Uh, Omar, let me know if I translate something wrong um, so that Clyde can, can hear and understand also. Um, I would like to know if Kaiso has thought uh, at any point um, about uh, storage, long-term storage, um, to mitigate the interday variability of solar and wind energy. So I so, guess it will not um, be battery. Well, let me take, yes. So, so we're doing a lot of work right now on long, the need for long-term storage. And we are looking at things out of the uh, lithium ion batteries. So there's a slew of technology we're looking at. The, energy, the California Energy Commission is spending over $300 million between this year and next year to look into long-term storage. And in one of my plots I showed, we had four consecutive days with very little wind, very little solar. So we know we will be needing long-term storage. The question is how much, what's the, the uh, duration. Um, we also think that stacking short-term storage together would not uh, do um, uh, justice uh, to the system. On September 6, we peaked. And during the peak demand day, we saw the need for longer than four-hour storage. Uh, during the, the ramps, during the peak and after the peak hours, we had to rely on storage quite a bit to, to um, help us through uh, the, the, the September 6th. So um, we know we need long-term storage. The question is how long, and those are the studies that's ongoing right now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, another question from Dr. Jaime Dwight Pinson. Um, he's asking, uh, did the, do the inverters for solar plants uh, actually installed in Kaiso's footprint, are they able to absorb or inject uh, reactive power when radiance is zero, solar radiance is near zero, like for example at night? I think you touched on that already, um, but maybe you could go yeah. over that. Uh, and I can, I can go over that again, yes. We have quite a few um, newer inverter-based resources, both wind and solar, that could produce uh, reactive when the wind's not blowing or the radiance is not there. So at night, uh, solar PV plants, if you have a smart controller, they can produce full reactive. And I had indicated all these solar plants need to do is to consume a small amount of reactive a non-reactive active power from the grid to energize the DC equipment. And once they can energize the DC equipment, they can produce full reactive. So one of the things that um, uh, we're gonna have to work through 
is who pays for that energy that this plant consumes to provide reactive power at night, let's say, or to provide reactive power when the wind's not blowing. So this is really a policy question, but it technically wind plants and solar plants, they can produce a reactive, full reactive, that is, when the wind is not blowing or the solar is not um, there. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, from Guillermo Sabatier, uh, very punctual question. What is Kaiso's generation mix generally during off-peak hours? I can't say that one. So I, I think it's going to it's not going to be a precise answer because it depends what day of the year, what season of the year. So it's quite dynamic and the generation fleet is changing. I was just looking, for instance, what happened last night, right? How the mix was. And I can tell you, for instance, uh, our renewal was still 3,700 megawatts because we still have wind. So the solar was off, but the wind may still be there. We have about 6,000 megawatts of imports, 2,000 megawatts of nuclear, almost 1,000 megawatts of batteries, 6,000 megawatts of imports, and 2,000 megawatts of hydro. This is still a quite diverse generation fleet. Uh, the main component is that the solar is no longer there, but the wind is still there, the batteries are there, and the conventional generation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Omar was asking about a, if there is in Kaiso or are you developing a market product for uh, long-term storage? I don't think right now we explicitly have ambition a product, market product. What we have in China as Klein indicated is that we're trying to keep pace with the technology, right? We see the need for long-term duration uh, storage. Right now, the integration that we have is about uh, a few thousand megawatts of short-term duration storage, like four-hour storage. And the effort that we have spent a lot of time nowadays is effectively to properly and effectively integrate this in short-term duration. And it's not through a new market product, it doesn't mean that we may not have to explore a new product in the future, but rather to be able to efficiently dispatch the resources taking into account the characteristics. And I think this is really the key point, trying to internalize all the characteristics, all the limitations of these resources is where we have to spend a lot of effort envisioning how to properly dispatch those because, for instance, the four hour duration storage it poses a lot of challenges because with such a short window, uh, we have to properly optimize when to charge and discharge those resources, right? Something that I was mentioning, for instance, what happened in the September 6th, four hours is not long enough to cover the ramp and the peak. And you are already going into high prices with a lot of generation needs early in the day. How can you trade off to ensure that you don't discharge the batteries prematurely for the sake of preserving that capacity for the peak, the most critical time, right? And that has to do a lot with optimization. Uh, for instance, something that we have been using for many years is what we call this multi-interval optimization. The one that allows you not only to know the conditions for the next five minutes, but for the next hour, for the next four hours, because that will give you the ability to properly position resources for the for the future. There are many other challenges to, to manage, for instance, unlike any other conventional generation, what we call the state of charge. It's not just a matter of charging, discharging, how, how much a, a state of charge you utilize right now or how much you have is going to largely influence how it's going to be dispatched for the future. So these are the, the complexities that we are dealing with. And at this point, we are just trying to internalize these complexities. And so far, we haven't explored the need to have a, a different product. It's still an energy product, and ancillary service product. They can actually provide a lot of ancillary services, such as regulation. They are great to provide regulation services. And so far, we don't have any new product for that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we are way over the top of our hour. <laughs> Thank you all so much for your questions. Thank you presenters um, for your 
super informative presentations. And um, I'm going to call an end to this webinar. And um, I will see the XM and Kaiso people on the Zoom call in five minutes. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you.